Welcome everyone to Give God 90 Radio On Demand. My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me today. As promised, I'm going to dig a little deeper into Psalm 119, and you're going to see that Psalm 119 is prophetic. Maybe not the way you thought about uh, something being prophetic, but it is very, very, very prophetic. Uh, If you are part of the ever-growing number of listeners to my audio podcast, I thank you so very much. If you haven't done so, consider downloading the Give God 90 app. It is absolutely free. Someone else has paid for it, so you don't have to. It takes about a minute to download. I am so uh, <laughs> humbled by the number of people that are listening to this. Uh, you know, really, I never expected the things that I would have to to talk about and the way that I would express uh trying to convince you to live the way God designed you to live would be carried around the world. I never expected anything like this. I, I didn't ask for this. I didn't, uh, you know, and, it, and it's quite honestly humbling and, and kind of tough when I think about the number of people from around the world that reach to me and um, message me and, and comment on things and they say not such nice things and Really, I am I am extremely humbled and and appreciative. I don't know how to express that other than to say thank you so very very much for uh, allowing me to hopefully bless you with what we're doing from Give God ninety. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to mention is please, if you haven't been to GiveGodNinety dot com, check that out. Follow some of the links we have there because some of those things uh, that are associ- that I associate with, um, like my pictures, that helps support what we do. Uh, there's a place there for what's called Zero Shoes. If you click on that and if you actually buy something from there, uh, we get a portion of that back. That way, you know, it helps support what we do as well. And I have never met the folks that do that. I have uh, contacted them through email. We have their shoes. They are probably some of the most comfortable shoes there is. Don't want to turn this into a shoe sales advertisement. But quite honestly, they are the closest thing I have found to protecting your feet while allowing you to walk the way your creator designed you to walk. And that is very, very close to not having anything at all on your feet. Very light, um, very natural. It allows you to. Your, it allows your feet to flex, and uh, trust me, I have injured both of my feet at some point in my life. Uh, the first time when I was fourteen on my right foot. The second time about twenty years ago on my left foot. Um, I had pins the second time, and and it's not fun when you have a foot injury. It really isn't. And uh, check those out. See if it's something you're interested in. And help support Give God 90 at the same time. Let me go on to Psalm 119 now. Okay. Um, when I when I say that Psalm 119 is prophetic, maybe you don't maybe what your idea of prophetic is isn't what the biblical idea of prophetic is. When we think about prophecy in the Bible, it's not about telling the future. It's about relaying a message that you have received directly from the throne room. Whether God spoke to you in a vision or a dream, or whether like uh, Daniel and like Zechariah, he comes to you through Gabriel, another messenger. Uh, I know that he, we see in Joshua that he spoke to Joshua through another messenger. So we have all of these ways that the Almighty gets his message to us. And the job of a prophet then is to take that message and give it to the people that you are directed to give it to. Okay? Sometimes it's a message specifically for you. Sometimes it is a message for a group. It will never be, okay, now this is very, very careful things that we have to say here. A prophet would never say to an individual, God told me to tell you to go here and do this. Okay? That's not a prophet's job. 
A prophet's job is to put you back in line living the way your creator designed you to live. If you'll notice, all of the major prophets and even the minor prophets, they had a message for the nation. Okay? And that message typically was, you're going the wrong way. You need to turn around and do things the way, you know, <laughs> the way God tells us to do it. It's that simple. So as we look at Psalm 119, we understand what David's trying to convey here, I hope. And what he's, what he's saying is that we can get to know God by getting to know his word. Getting to know the things that he's spoken. And we do the same thing today uh, in various ways. I happen to have met a, a gentleman many years ago who was uh, part of the uh, FBI. And he was one of the first ones to start looking at if we get to know uh, who some of these criminals are by the things that they say or the things that they write, you know, inter intercepting letters that they write then we'll know the person and we can figure out who they are and what drives them. So David started this very early on in his uh, songwriting career, if I can, can say that. But his songwriting is very, very prophetic. He, he tells us as he begins, and I'm going to use the Tree of Life version here. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the instructions of Yehovah. Now think about this. You know, several hundred years later, somebody else is going to say, blessed are those over and over and over again. David starts this very early on. David being a prophet, hearing straight from the throne room, knows that he, the best way for him to start out is to say, look, if you want righteousness, blamelessness, you have to walk in the Father's instructions. It's that simple. He's saying you have to live the way your Creator designed you to live. That's what he's telling us. right? And that's you know, Psalm 119, verse 1. It goes on. Happy are those who keep his testimonies. Now, happy and blessed uh, are kind of interchangeable sometimes, not always, but, but often they are, they're used interchangeably. But look at, look at the next part of this. They seek him with their whole heart, their entirety. Not just a little bit, but with everything they've got. If you're seeking the Almighty with everything you've got, if you are so inclined that, you know, and, and I'm not saying you have to give up your day job, all right? That's not what I'm saying. But if you are so inclined to study and to dive into Scripture, to, under, to, to dig into it in such a way that you have a, a deep desire to understand what your Creator is trying to explain. That's what David says. You're going to be happy. You're going to be satisfied. You're going to be content. You're going to be so overtaken with um, joyfulness. That's what David's trying to explain. That is a prophetic word. And it works, you know, in David's day. And it works today as well. We see so many people today, you know, oh, well, I go to church every Sunday, but I just, I'm just so depressed. You're not seeking the Almighty with your whole heart. You know, spending an hour in a church service is not seeking the Almighty with your whole heart. I know I have spoken to pastors. I have um, somewhat counseled pastors who, and this is going to sound terrible, but they have actually uh, gone from being a pastor, 
being someone who is willing to teach God's word and they view it now as a job. Okay, they want to they want to do a 9 to 5 job 5 days a week. That's not what a pastor does. A pastor serves the people. The people's job is to uphold him as well. So when when you're folks, if you are in a church where your pastor is getting depressed and he's being discouraged, part of that might be your fault. Okay? Because your job is to be content as well. Your job is to be happy. Your job is to make sure and certain that you are seeking after God with your whole heart so that everything you say, everything you do, everywhere you go is pleasing in the eyes of the Creator. And that way you are content. You hold that joy. And therefore when somebody brings you a word, then you in turn are able to uplift that person. We often talk about, you know, there was only one of the prophets who didn't get murdered. And that's true that we, you know, for the ones that we see, they were typically killed because they were telling a king he was doing something wrong. And the kings didn't like that very well. And if your pastor is being discouraged, chances are he's telling you you're doing something wrong and you're not turning around. If if you happen to go to a, a church that's having those uh, issues and situations, I encourage you to take a stronger role in correcting it. Because if you're listen, if you're in that one of those churches and you're listening to me, then you're digging for something deeper. I can already tell that we already know it. It's okay. Keep digging. I encourage you to be part of the solution and not uh, continued part of the problem. Um, let's, let's, I don't want to take, I don't want to take a whole lot of time, uh, reading Psalm 119. I'd rather you read it, you dig into it, but some things to look for, some things to, that we need to highlight. Uh, you know, if we look at, at verse 65, you do good to your servant, Those who serve you, you take care of. And he says, it's according to your word that we can see proof of this. And I I like the way that, (laughs) oh, it's kind of, it gives me a chuckle. In verse 66, the way they, they treat this in the Tree of Life version. Teach me good sense and knowledge. I trusted your mitzvot, your commands. You teach me, you know, let me have some good sense. Let me have, please put some intelligence and some good sense in my head. Now there, you can be educated, okay? You can educate anyone. But having them apply that education is what we're looking at here. We, we us older folks, you know, we called it good common sense. And and we look around at some things going on in the world today and say, well, there's just a lack of good common sense. <clears throat> and it seems to be that way. It's because we're not applying the word of our creator to our lives. Or we may be, which is why we can see that other people aren't. They're applying what the world teaches to their lives. <clears throat> and if you do that, you're not going to have that knowledge and that sense that David's speaking about you know, you're just not going to have it. You're not going to be content. You're not going to find that joy. You're not going to find all of those things. Now, I spoke the other evening uh, when Meyer read, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. David is is putting some things out here. He's saying, look, your word your word shows me where I need to go. Your word guides me. Your word directs me. Even though I may be severely afflicted, you are the one who keeps me alive. It's not uh, these things from the world that is doing this for me. It is me being so deeply involved in your word, getting to know you. 
<clears throat> Let me ask you this. We don't write a lot today like we used to. Um, you know, the, the art of writing letters, the art even of writing books. When I, when I wrote my first book, I was very surprised because I used grammar the way I learned it in school. And the publisher said, no, 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 we don't do that anymore. We need grammar uh, that is written on about the fourth, or fourth to sixth grade level so that the average person can understand it. Because even if a college graduate graduates, depending on their level of, of how they graduate, they will continue to revert and fall back and read on about the eighth grade level as a college graduate. <clears throat> and that's kind of a shame. Very good friends of mine, very good friends of mine uh, are, well, several of them have what I call, you know, it takes, uh, well, one in particular, Dr. Sean, you know, it takes about three cans of alphabet soup. If you were to dump them all out to fit all the letters, you know, that can go behind his name. Very, very intelligent, very, very wonderful person. If you get a chance to listen to him, you need to listen to Sean. He he does good. He, he brings in a lot of American politics in what he does and explains it very, very well. But here's the thing. Even Sean, when we're just talking, you know, friends talking to friends, right? I can tell he grew up in Sussex County just like I did. <clears throat> and And he goes back to, he reverts back to that. He forgets all that education. And he doesn't do it. He knows I know all those big words. But we just go back and we revert you know, to the stuff we grew up with. So it, it, that's why they, they do that. They say, you, know, you, you, you do this, you write it this way because people, people revert. What David's saying, though, what David's saying is give me some common sense. Give me some knowledge. Let me apply this properly. Let me apply this properly. When I do these things... Make sure that I remember it's your word that guides me. It's your word that gives me direction. It's your word that shows me where to go. <clears throat> he, he goes on and says, your on, the unfolding of your words give light in verse 130. Giving understanding to the simple. Even to the people who have a hard time. Even to the people who have a hard time. David says, Father, your words take care of us all. They're so easy. They are so easy. You can guide even the ones who have a difficult time. Today, you know, we, we call them uh uh, well, we say they have a disability. They don't have a disability. They have a different ability. Now, I know I grew up with uh, <clears throat> uh, friends that had learning disabilities, some more severe than others. But what, what abilities they did have were very good. Uh, one was a very, very good, uh, finished, accomplished carpenter. They could take, you know, woodworking tools and make them do things that other people just couldn't. <clears throat> Another was extremely adept at child care. You know, this this young lady growing up, they we weren't weren't really sure. And I, and I don't want to sound degrading to this, but we just weren't really sure if this person would ever make it. But it turns out they were so adept at, at child care because they could hear something in a baby's cry that nobody else could hear. They could understand what that child was crying. It was kind of amazing to watch that. Uh, other people have different abilities just because they may not be able to learn the the advanced mathematics like uh, trigonometry or calculus doesn't mean 
that they don't have abilities to serve their fellow man and their creator, right? David's saying, we're going to take something that's complex and we're going to make it easy. We're going to make this easy enough to understand. And all we have to do is think about it this way, or we can think about it that way. We can think about it another way. However we need to think about the Almighty, we, we don't put him in a box. We take him out of the box, let God be God. But we look at the whole completeness of what God is. We don't, we don't take little sections at a time, even though that's kind of what he's thinking. You know, when we look about it, we have this Greek polytheistic thinking, and we say, well, God's word can be light. God's word can be this. God's word can be that. God's word can be something else. And we like to put it in these little compartments. And David's saying, we can think about it like that, but ultimately what we have to do is we have to take all of those compartments and open them up and think about all of it. Now, we can take little bits and pieces at a time and study little bits and pieces, but even when we're done studying, you don't stick in a box, it goes back to the whole. Okay? That's what he's saying. That's what we're looking at. Those are the things that David's talking about. Now, to be prophetic... Yes, it does come straight from the throne room. I've known people who really like to throw around that phrase, well, the Lord spoke to me and said, well, maybe the, maybe he did, but there's a couple of people I know that throw that out so often. It's like, you know, if I'm holding a conversation, if God's speaking to me like that, I wouldn't be in the situation you're in. Okay? Just saying. As we look around, and we see the problems in the church. And there's a lot of problems in the churches today. We look around and I can tell you without a doubt in my mind. The majority of the problems in the churches today. Are the direct result. Of people following their church doctrine or their traditions. And not following God's word. I'm going to say that again. I want, I want there to be no doubt about this. <clears throat> the majority of problems in the churches today are the result of people following their traditions or their church doctrines and not following the Word of God. It's that simple. I've just taken something complicated and may hopefully made it really easy for you. We look around and I see pastors who are in trouble. I see pastors and congregants who are sick. And they're, these, these churches are, are, I mean, on their knees praying for them. They're not being healed. That's not what Scripture's telling us. Scripture says if we're asking the right questions and we're, we're trying to, to uh, do things the way the Almighty would have us do them, these people should be healed, right? So why aren't they being healed? Because we're the ones who are failing to live the way our Creator designed us to live. We're the ones who are still sick in sin. We are the ones who are not doing our jobs. We are the ones. You know, God's still God. He's still there. He still wants to help us. He still wants to provide for us. But it's not a gimme, gimme, gimme situation, right? Right? You know, God, you got to do this for me. God, you got to do that for me. God, I need a new car. God, I need a new house. God, oh, where am I going to get the money for the roof on my house? Where am I going to get the money to fix my car? Where am I going to get the money? Where am I going to get this? Oh, my kids, you got to do something about my kids. They're just run ragged. Oh, they're, oh, look at that. They're working so hard, but they ain't getting nowhere. You know what I'm saying, right? You, you may have been guilty of saying those things. I was until I realized I'm part of the problem. And what we need to be as believers is part of the solution. And we need to be united as part of the solution. Not just in in our communities, not just in the United States, not just in your country, but around the world. We've got to tear down, and I'm here we go, we've got to tear down the walls of tradition. We need to tear down the walls of denomination and we've got to say, okay, 
The Bible tells us this is our example. Why are we not doing this? The Bible gives us these outlines and says this is the way you should be doing things. Why aren't we doing those things? Many of us define words improperly. We think about worship. And when we think about worship, how do we define worship? We define worship as going to a place and gathering with other believers, maybe singing a few songs, maybe hearing the word. In Genesis, and yes, you know I always go back to Genesis, Adam's job of tending the garden was worship. Let me say that again. If you go back and you read, Adam's job of tending the garden was a form of worship. Think about that. Taking something so complicated as you you have to go to a building, you have to do this, you have to do that. No. Worship is whatever you do, you do to the best of your ability, not for yourself, but for your Creator. You don't have to stand and listen to music with your hands raised. And you got to do it just right. You know, you have the people who raise their hands way up. You have the people who just kind of stand there. And you got the people who, oh, my hands aren't raised, but I'm turning my palms just a little bit. You, you've seen them. You've seen them. That's not necessarily worship. That is what our modern concept of worship is. Worship is accomplishing a task, not for yourself, but for your Creator. And doing it with the skills that he gives you to to use to the best of your ability. Being the best you you can be. And it doesn't matter if that is teaching a calculus class. It doesn't matter if you're changing diapers. You know, (laughs) pastors are not necessarily what we think of as pastors either. They're not just teachers. They're servants. They serve. They like to be called shepherds, but you know what a shepherd's real job is? Is to make sure that every one of the sheep in that flock or the goats in that flock are healthy. They're content. They are happy. And David gives us those concepts. A pastor's job should be to convince you that you have to use your whole heart to seek your Creator. Do you see how that just came back around? Out of everything I just talked about, out of everything that we need to do, what David said so long ago holds true today. Now, if that's not prophecy, I don't know what is. If you want to be content, if you want to be happy, you have to be willing To seek God with your whole heart. And again, that doesn't mean giving up your day job. It doesn't mean leaving the things that pay your bills. What it means is using those things. Not to benefit yourself or someone else even. But to first benefit your creator. Then you benefit the people around you. And you watch it all come back as it benefits you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I am starting to lose my voice just a little bit. It's springtime, and I do have some spring allergies. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to cut this just a little bit short. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you understand what a prophet is just a little bit better, and what prophecy is just a little bit better. It's not just fortune telling, it's not telling about the future. It is convincing you to live the way your Creator designed you to live. Until next week, have a blessed, blessed time.